I want to thank uh, everybody who's been involved in bringing me here to Kansas City. It's been a whirlwind two days. We were at the National Archives last night, and now we are here in this building that I must say I've spent a lot of time in my brain in over the last six years uh, since uh, in writing about the history of Fred Harvey while Fred Harvey himself lived in Leavenworth, and the Harvey Company was uh, spread from at, at its peak from Cleveland all the way to California. The second floor of Kansas City Union Station was the absolute hub of the Fred Harvey business. Everything they saw about America that they, that they took to people was from a Kansas Cityan's view. And before this building, they were in the old uh, Union Depot before it burned down. So I have spent a lot of time in your town, in my brain, over the last few years. Um, I think that the easiest way for me to get you into the uh, gestalt of this book and the idea of what we wanted to do with the Fred Harvey story would be uh, if you have a moment for me to read a little bit from the beginning of the book. And so, who the hell is Fred Harvey? On that spring night in 1882, the drunken cowboys riding through northern New Mexico could have been forgiven for squinting in disbelief at the site of the Montezuma Hotel. It did appear to be a hallucination. The Montezuma was one of the most astonishing architectural creations in America although perhaps most astonishing was its location. It was nestled in a gorgeous middle of nowhere in the foothills of the Sangre de Cristo Mountains, six miles outside of Las Vegas, New Mexico, an old Santa Fe trail town that the railroad had only recently connected to civilization. The largest wood frame building in the United States, the Queen Anne style Montezuma featured a dining room that seated 500, a casino, a breathtaking wine cellar, 11 bowling alleys, a billiard hall, and an immense therapeutic bathing facility offering six different kinds of baths and douches so patrons could fully experience the medicinal powers of the underground hot springs. The service at the Montezuma was brilliant, with staff imported from the best hotels in New York, London, Chicago, and St. Louis. And the cuisine was amazingly ambitious. The food combined the expertise of classically trained chefs from the restaurant capitals of the world, with fresh regional American ingredients, fruit, vegetables, and shellfish, as well as delicacies like green turtles and sea celery harvested by pearl-diving Yaqui tribesmen, to which few other kitchens in the country had access, and which most chefs wouldn't come to fully appreciate for almost another century. Open for only a few weeks, the resort was already attracting dukes and princesses and presidents, who quickly booked patches, passage on the Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe the upstart railroad whose newly laid tracks were the only way to get there. In front of the Montezuma was a large park, exquisitely landscaped with shade trees and rare flowers, planted in three train car loads of imported sod and topsoil. At the center was a huge fountain flanked by lawns for tennis and croquet, an archery range, and even a zoo where the deer and the antelope literally played. The freeform park was illuminated, as was the building itself, by thousands of gaslights. So when Red John and his men approached on horseback that night, they could not believe their bloodshot eyes. The cowboys rode first to the park where they hollered and shot their guns in the air while galloping across the manicured bluegrass and graveled walks. The commotion could be heard throughout the hotel, from its grand entranceway to its cavernous main dining room. There it reached a tall, slim man in his mid-forties with a perfectly groomed Van Dyke beard, deep, cautious eyes, and senses that were always cocked. He tried to ignore the noise and enjoy his dinner, but soon threw down his linen napkin and rose abruptly from his cane back chair. The man was dressed fastidiously in a dark blue suit with a waistcoat and dangling watch fob, the formal uniform of a Victorian gentleman from his homeland in England. But he walked quickly with the nervous energy of America, drawing the attention of the dining room staff and some of the guests as he passed. By the time he left the dining room, the cowboys had dismounted and were running riot through the hotel. He could hear them in the billiard hall, where they were taking target practice with the Indian relics and curios displayed above the bar, shooting the tops off private label liquor bottles on the sideboard. Boys, put up your guns, the Englishman called out, striding into the room. Who the hell are you, Red John asked. My name is Fred Harvey, he replied. I run this place, and I will not have any rowdies here. If you don't behave like gentlemen, you can't stay here, and you can't come again. Now put up your guns and take a drink with Fred Harvey. Although he had been in America for 30 years, 
Fred still retained his British accent, which made some Westerners titter. But as the cowboys laughed, cursed, and taunted him, and hotel guests started gathering, he walked over and grabbed Red John by the collar. In a single motion, the fastidious Englishman yanked the dusty desperado over the bar and pinned him to the floor. You mustn't swear in this place, he told the stunned cowboy. There was a moment of silence. And then Red John told his men to stand down. Fred Harvey is a gentleman, boys, he declared, brushing himself off. I say, let's have those drinks. When the drinks were done, they were served a midnight breakfast as well, the breakfast for which Fred Harvey was becoming famous. The freshest eggs and steak available in the country, shipped directly from farms in refrigerated train cars. Pan-sized wheat cakes stacked six high, quartered wedges of hot apple pie, and cup after cup of the best damn coffee these cowboys had ever had in their lives. Red John and his men never made trouble with the Montezuma again. But they still wanted to know, as did more and more people across the country, who the hell is Fred Harvey? <laughs> more than a century later, I am peering over the lip of the Grand Canyon in my pajamas at 5 o'clock in the morning, and I am wondering the same thing. As the sun slowly illuminates the canyon walls, I am reminded of why there is a substantial literature just explaining why words cannot describe what I am seeing. But as I turn away from the canyon, I take in another sight, less awe-inspiring, but in many ways equally intriguing, because it was created by man, by Americans, and plunked here on the very edge of the divine abyss. It is El Tovar, the rustically majestic hotel that has afforded me the luxury of rolling out of a plush bed at sunrise, shuffling in my slippers down a curved oak staircase, and stepping outside to have the Grand Canyon pretty much to myself. El Tovar is arguably the most in-demand hotel in the world. Most of the guest rooms are booked up more than a year in advance. El Tovar is also one of the last places where Fred Harvey lives on. The founder of the family business that created this hotel and America's first hospitality empire, he still symbolically oversees every detail of its daily life, from his moody portrait hanging in the main lobby, next to where the maitre d' arrives each morning at 6.30 to greet the throng of tourists queued for the renowned breakfast with a view. In the painting, he looks formidable and, frankly, a bit anxious, a clenched fist protruding from his black waistcoat. Most visitors to the Grand Canyon don't have an inkling of why this Englishman in the portrait matters or how he changed America. They are not aware that there was a time not that long ago when Fred Harvey was one of the most famous and intriguing men in the country, a food missionary, as one prominent New York critic called him, on a quest to civilize these United States one meal at a time. They don't know that his waitresses, the legendary Harvey girls, were the first female workforce in America, allowing single women for the first time to travel independently, earn a decent living, and over time help settle the West. I was similarly unenlightened when I first encountered the Fred Harvey saga during a visit to the Grand Canyon in the early 1990s. I discovered him, as so many others have, in a sepia-toned photo in a brochure. But then I started tripping across pieces of his story and his legacy and travels all over the country, although mostly in the areas that, as a born and bred Easterner, I think of as America's better half. Over the years, Fred Harvey has become something of an obsession, because it seems that the more I learn about him, his family, his business, and his world, the more I understand about my own homeland and how it came to be. Seen through the prism of the Harvey family saga, the late 1800s, a period many of us slept through in high school history class, becomes a powerful, riveting drama of a great nation expanding and uniting, one steel rail at a time. And the formative years of the American century take on a different meaning. Now, besides all those reasons, there's another one, which I think is best exemplified by this photo. This is my wife. Diane, and this picture was taken at El Tovar Hotel in 1993 on our first visit there. As you can see, she's spinning six guns, which I had bought for her at the Fred Harvey gift shop at El Tovar. <laughs> and if you look closer, you can see she is wearing a sheriff star. Uh, when my wife was a kid, uh, she liked to dress up as a cowboy. They called her Black Bart because she dressed all in black. And I knew that, and I thought that buying her the six gun would be great. And this picture is actually hung over my desk for most of the later part of my career. 
And I think what it shows, and one of the things that really got me interested in writing about Fred Harvey, is that glee that comes from America's Western past. 